Well, good morning. Let me invite you to take your Bibles this morning, whether they're print copy or an electronic version there. Join me in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 1. If you're new with us today at Cross Point, let me add my word of welcome. And um, we are walking through a series that we're calling Joy Full through the book of Philippians. And as I've said to you the first couple of weeks, if you were to uh, write one word as a theme across the book of Philippians, it would be the word joy, right? But uh, not a, um, more of what we call a deep happy, right? Not a, ooh, I like ice cream kind of happy, but a, a deep happy, something that flows further and deeper and stronger than just the emotions of the moment. And so Philippians chapter 1 and, uh, hey, you know, when you go to the, the beach, I love to go to the beach, and um, you have these little plastic molds, you know what I'm talking about, in the different shapes, and you put the sand in there, and you pat it down, and then you turn it over, and it, it makes a shape uh, uh, or whatever, right? And you, know, you put the sand in there. Same thing uh, for, like, cookies, you know? Uh, I like the beach. I like cookies, too, now come to think of it. There may be a theme going on uh, here, but, uh, but anyhow, so cookies, right? You put them in a, in a mold or a, a desserts or cakes or whatever, and, and they bake, and then they come out of the mold, and it's in that shape, right? It was a shaping influence. Um, c- concrete, you know, it just kind of runs everywhere, but if you put it into a mold or a shape, right? And so if you're like us, we have these, um, with these concrete molds in the flower beds and spaces around the house with different size shaped kids' hands in them from their different ages across the years and this kind of thing, right? You know, and so you put it in there and it kind of shapes it and molds it. We think about shaping influences in our lives, and uh, we would say that um, parents are a shaping influence on in our life, good or bad, right or wrong. Parents have a, a shaping influence in, in our lives. I would say that coaches also have a, a shaping influence in the lives of young people. Uh, a friend of mine who wrote material called 3D, three-dimensional coaching, he says that the two most powerful words in the English language are coach says. You know, why are you here at 5.30 in the morning working out? Coach said I was supposed to, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and so coaches, and I, I would even, I would even want to make certain we include that, that, that teachers are a, a strong shaping influence in our lives. I mean, I can think about the men and the women that were my teachers from elementary school all the way through um, high school and college and, and beyond. And there are little things that they said. I mean, they taught me, you know, the basics, right, to read and write and math and science and social studies and that kind of thing. But more than that, right, it was the conversations and the things that were said after class or before class or at lunch or in the hallways, right? There's a shaping influence of these people in our lives. And so we look back and go, hey, I've, I've really been shaped as to who I am by all of these shaping influences. And in the book of Philippians, we see that there is a shaping influence in the lives of the Philippians. And here's that shaping influence. It's the gospel, all right? Now listen, gospel is a church word, right? And so let's, let's flesh that out, right? When we say the gospel, we talk about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? The, the good news of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, he was buried, and he rose on the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. And so we've seen here in just these first eight verses that Paul says, hey, the gospel should have a shaping influence in not only the way you live out your life, but the way that you relate to one another. And as the gospel shapes us, it gives us the right mindset, right, to understand who God is and who we are in relation to him and understand what God has done for us in Christ. And that mindset allows us to make the choice of joy. And so let's pick up this morning in chapter 1 in verse 9. Paul says, and I pray this. In all of Paul's letters to the various churches, he prays for them. And uh, he mentions prayer and he's praying for uh, matters uh, of the heart. And notice what he says here. This I pray for you, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment, so that you may approve the things that are superior, or your text may, your translation may use the word excellent, the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray together. God in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the good news of the gospel. God, thank you for a joy 
that surpasses everything in this life. Thank you, Father, for a family of faith to live this joy out. And so this morning, Lord, would you grow us in our love for one another as Paul prayed then, that we would pray now, that our love would abound more and more to the glory and the praise of Jesus and you the Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so here's the, the big idea, if you're note-taking, here's the big idea out of the text. Everything that we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, everything that we say and do should be shaped by God's love. Everything that we say and do should be shaped by God's love. Now, I want to be careful because uh, some of you men in the room have already checked out on me. You're like, oh my gosh, he's talking about sappy emotionalism and this kind of thing. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about Valentine's Day kind of stuff, right? <laughs> love is a choice. Love is a choice. Kind of like when my mother would get on to my brother and I for something that we did, right? And she would say, Go to your room and get away from him. She said, because I'm choosing to love you right now because I don't like you very much. <laughs> I appreciate the choice that she was making to not express her love to me in a disciplinary fashion at that moment, right? So love is a choice. When we talk about love, when we talk about godly, Christ-like love, when we talk about that kind of love, what, what is it that we mean? You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, look, I love the Georgia Bulldogs. I love barbecue. I love Trisha, but I probably don't love them all in the same way or to the same degree. Is that a wise thing to say? Absolutely, right? So what does it mean when we say love? What, what is that? What choice is it that we're making? In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to a church in Corinth that was messed up. I mean, just jacked up, messed up. They couldn't get along. They argued about everything. This one said, I'm more spiritual than this one and that and the other. And I mean, they all, all kind of, there was jacked up mess going on. And right in the middle of this argument that they're having, Paul gives them uh, 1 Corinthians 13 that we know as the love chapter, right? You know, yep, you had it at your wedding like we did. Uh, contextually, Paul's, he's actually speaking to a bunch of messed up Christians <laughs> at, the, at the moment, a bunch of carnal Christians. I'm not certain that that probably should have been at my wedding. But anyhow, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Listen, listen to what Paul says. He says, love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So when we talk about Jesus' godly, Christ-like love for people, we're talking about the choice to be like that. I, I, it is the choice to be patient, the choice to be kind, the choice to not envy and to not be boastful. It's the choice not to be arrogant or rude. It's the choice not to be self-seeking. It's the choice not to be irritable. It's the choice not to keep a, a record of wrongs, right? People talk about they get, you know, some people say they get hysterical, so other people get historical, and they just bring up everything, right? It's the choice to not find joy and celebrate when somebody messes up in unrighteousness, but rather to rejoice in the truth. It is the choice to bear all things, to believe all things, to hope all things, and to endure all things. That's what godly Christ-like love is, right? And so when Paul says, this I'm praying for you, that your love will keep on growing, he, he mentions for them in verse 4 that he's praying for them, and here we find out the specifics that he's praying for their love. Well, why pray for their love? <laughs> because it's the hallmark expression of their faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 on down in verse 13 says this at the end of the chapter. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. At the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says that if you know everything, if you have all wisdom and you can explain all things but you don't have love, you're like a clanging cymbal and a noisy gong. Or in our day and age, so you're, like, you're like fingernails across a chalkboard. You're just, you're just you know, without love, we just grate on people's nerves. 
He's praying for their love. It's the hallmark expression of their faith. John chapter 13 and verse 35, Jesus said, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so the word that is translated for love in the, in the Greek language, in the, which is what the New Testament, Koine Greek was what the New Testament was originally in, right? There were six, the, the Greeks had six words for love. I mean, they knew that they loved the Georgia Bulldogs and they loved barbecue and they loved their wives, right? But they, they knew that you didn't say that all the same thing. I mean, you know, <clears throat> I can say to Stephen, I love you, man. And that's not weird, right? No, that's not weird at all, right? And so there were different words for love. And so the word that's translated here in, in Philippians chapter 1 is the Greek word agape, right? Which is the word that refers to the love of God. It's a no strings attached, unconditional kind of love. Now, we don't naturally love like that, right? I mean, if you do, you're a unicorn. I'm just saying, we don't normally love like that, right? There's usually some reason that we, I mean, we like people, but we really love those that we get along with. We, we, we can like a lot of people, but we really love those that have done something for us, right? There's usually something that is attached to that. But the word that's translated here literally means an unconditional, no strings attached. It is God's love to us, for us, and through us in Jesus Christ. And so Paul is praying for maturity. He's praying for the Philippians to be mature in their faith, and he begins by praying for them to grow in their love. After all, if our Christian love is what it ought to be, then everything else will follow. And so I want you to see four attributes of this mature love that Paul is praying for, not only for the Philippians, but that ought to be evident in mine and your lives and in our fellowship of faith as well. So the first is this, our love should be plentiful. Our love should be plentiful, right? By our faith in Jesus Christ, our capacity to love explodes, right? I mean, I, we, God blessed us with, with children, and I learned, oh my goodness, like you just never realized you could love like that, right? You know? And so our love should be plentiful. Look in, in verse 9. He says, and I pray this, that your love will keep on growing, or your text may say abound, right? So the word for abound or keep growing literally means to overflow or to exceed a fixed measure. It just starts overflowing out of the cup and over the banks of the river. He says, I pray that it would abound or that it would keep growing more and more. So what Paul is recognizing here is he's saying, hey, when I look at you, I see that you're loving one another. That's awesome. That's good. He said, I pray that you'll keep on doing it more and more, that you'll keep growing in that, that you'll move forward, right, and grow in that love for one another, not move backwards and grow and fall out of love. I think to a certain degree, he's speaking of the fact that the way that we love people, there ought to be a watching world that says, hey, there's something different about, there's something different about them, right? But more specifically, I believe that Paul is talking about the specific demonstrations of loving one another inside the church, inside the family of faith. He says, listen, you're loving one another, that's good. I'm going to pray that you keep growing and you do it more and more until it just kind of overflows and just runs all over the place. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, Paul says, This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us, right? We come to repentance and faith in Jesus, right? And so we receive the gift of salvation, and with that we receive the gift of the indwelling presence of God in the person of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul says here that, this, that, that God's love has been poured out into us Right? Through the Holy Spirit who's given to us. The word poured out literally means there it, that it gushes out. It has an unending supply. It has an unending supply because it is from God through the Holy Spirit. It has an eternal source. Think about that. We have no excuse not to love people. No good excuse. Paul says, I pray that it would be more and more. 
it just keep growing. It just keep growing. You just be known as people that are loving. Because of the work of Jesus in our lives, we have an unlimited capacity to love people. Listen to me. If it flows into us, do not become a pond and become stagnant. If it flows into us, it should flow through us and out of us into the lives of others. Right? We're just a conduit. We, we receive the love of God and we share the love of God. We receive the love of God. It's poured out in our lives and it just is unending and it swells up and, and, and billows over and it flows out of our lives into the lives of others. So putting our faith in Jesus is the cause and loving others is the effect. So when we say that our love should be plentiful, there's a practical application for this. The people around us should not be love-starved. The people around us should not be love-starved. There is a plentiful source, right, in our lives, and as it flows in and through and out of us to others, it ought to have, a, it ought to have an impact on the people around us. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40, I'll boil it down to this. They asked him, he said, hey, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, well, the greatest commandment is what? You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and your mind, with everything that you have. And he said, and the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now stick with me on this. Obeying the greatest commandment, which is to love the Lord with everything that we have, is the key to keeping the second greatest commandment, which is to love our neighbor as ourself. Amen. The first produces the second. So if you have a problem loving someone, if you have a problem being loving toward a person or toward a group of people, your real problem is that you're not loving God. Because if we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then it flows through us and we love others as we love ourselves. Problems on the horizontal this way are always a reflection of problems in the vertical between us and God. I mean, at the very centerpiece of our faith, is the cross, right? The cross of Christ, where he died for our sins, paid the price for our sins, poured out that forgiveness for us. And so problems in this way are always an indication of problems in this way. Let me give you this uh, image uh, of a triangle. It's real, real simple, right? I, seminary, this, went to seminary so I could show you this. In, the, in, in our lives, we have relationships, right? And so there's you and there's me, right? Whoever me and you is, right? There's you and there's me and there's God. And so here we are, right? If we want to get closer to one another, we both need to what? We both need to get closer in our relationship with God, right? So the more that we love God, the closer we are to one another. That is, I mean, that's the picture of the principle and so as we grow in our love for God, we ought to be growing in our love for others. And Paul said, I pray that it just keeps happening more and more and more. And so first of all, our love should be plentiful. Secondly, I want you to see that our love should be perceptive. In the second part of verse 9, he says, I pray your love will keep growing in knowledge and in every kind of discernment. Our knowledge should be perceptive. Paul is qualifying what this overflowing love should look like, right? He said, I pray that your love will just keep abounding and overflowing. And he said, now here's what it looks like. Overflowing, abounding love is not sentiment, sentimentality or emotion, but rather he said it's what? Knowledge and discernment. Uh, think of it this way. Knowledge and discernment are like banks of a river that, that help to guide the direction and the flow of the love of God, right? We need knowledge and we need discernment. Paul said, I pray that you'll grow and abound more and more in your love, right? That you will grow in your knowledge and discernment. So let's look at these two banks 
that help us to understand and perceive the right way to love people. First of all is the word knowledge. It refers to a mature knowledge that is brought on by experience. Listen, love needs knowledge to be responsible. When Trisha and I got married almost 23 years ago, I was dumber than, than I am now. I just knew that I loved her. But if I was going to love her well and lead well, I, she needed me to do what? She needed me to learn some things. She needed me to have some knowledge of, of what it meant to be a husband and what it meant to be a husband in certain circumstances, right? Not just wake up and go, well, I think I'll try this today. No, to grow and to mature in that love, right? To have a mature knowledge brought on by experience. Love needs knowledge to be responsible. It's not just follow your heart or, or do what you feel like doing. No, we should lead our heart and we should test our feelings by God's truth. And so he says, I pray that you'll grow, that your love just keep growing, that you'll better understand who God is and better understand how to love people, that you'll have a knowledge of what that really looks like. He says, not only knowledge, but discernment. It speaks of insight. We might have affection for another person, but that doesn't mean that we have the right to express that affection any way we see fit. We need to bring discernment to the situation. Hey, men, listen to me. We love people, but there are boundaries, wise boundaries, of how you should express that, especially toward females. We need discernment. We need the Holy Spirit to translate so that what comes out of our mouth is good and pure and lovely, not crude and inappropriate. Even in the church. So I mean, I can't, why is he even talking about this? Because men say dumb things. We say inappropriate things, sometimes because we're empty, and sometimes because we say dumb things that come out inappropriately. But there are boundaries there, right? There are boundaries when it comes to, to loving and helping people, right? We see someone in need. So like, take counseling, for instance. Whether you are counseling somebody one-on-one, -on -one, right? Or, or they're seeking counseling from a professional. Counseling is not just a sitting down and exchanging of ideas, Biblical counseling is about bringing the truth and the knowledge and the wisdom of God to bear on the situation with Holy Spirit discernment. I mean, you can sit around the water cooler or over coffee and just ad nauseum have a conversation about your feelings, but if you don't bring the Spirit and the truth of God into it, then there's no wisdom, there's no discernment. That's not very loving. Also, listen, sometimes the most loving thing that you can tell someone, stop sinning, repent, turn back to God. And so there needs to be discernment. Now he says, I pray that you'd have this knowledge and discernment. Notice that it says, so that or in order that. That's a purpose clause, right? He said, I pray that you'll have that so that in order that, verse 10, so that you may approve the things that are superior. You might approve the things that are excellent. The word approve here literally means to test metal or to test coins to determine if they meet specific standards. When I read that this week, I, I thought about the uh, movie Karate Kid. Part two. Anybody, like the original. Anybody remember this? And they were selling the, 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 the produce. They were, you bring your produce, and the guys with the bad guys were, 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 were weighing it out, right? I remember Daniel's son came along, and it, he accidentally flipped the cart over, over and the weights fell off, and, it, and they realized what? They weren't true. They weren't right. They weren't superior. They weren't excellent. 
They were a fraud. He said, I pray that you'll grow in this knowledge and this discernment so that you can approve, so that you'll know what really true Christ-like love is. Our love for one another is not based on our feelings, but on what Christ has done for us. And we need knowledge and discernment as those two banks of the river to help us so that we can approve and distinguish between what is vital and what is trivial. Listen to me, church, because in the life of a church, the difference between what is vital and what is trivial will cause a lot of problems. Paul says, I pray that you'll grow in your understanding so that you can approve, you can distinguish between what is, what is worth of our time and energy and what is not. It keeps us from getting distracted by our feelings. Listen, our feelings are real. If you're new with us, I did a whole series back in the spring on, on emotional health, and we dealt with feelings and, you can, and the gospel, and you get in all that, so I'll say this. Feelings are real, but they should not be our guide or our master. Our feelings are not substantial enough to negate the truth of God. And so Paul says, I pray that as you love one another, it would just overflow. It would just abound more and more. But I pray that you'd have knowledge and discernment to be able to distinguish between what's worth getting tore up about and what's not worth getting tore up about. And most of the time in my life, 11 times out of 10, what I get tore up about is probably not worth getting tore up about. I mean, is that just true? Yeah. Heard a story about a dad and his son that were at Lowe's. That's a good place for a dad and his son to be. They were at Lowe's. And the little boy was pitching a fit and screaming and flailing his arms. And the dad wanted to express his love with a strong hand to the backside of this young boy. Now, my dad would have done it right there in the middle of Lowe's. Said when he got into the checkout line, the, the dad began to say out loud, Calm down, Jerry. It'll be all right, Jerry. You'll be home soon, Jerry. As he's putting his items on the counter and the cashier, the clerk was ringing him up. The store employee said to him, said, Sir, I, I want to commend you for how patient you're being with little Jerry. The dad looked at the employee and he said, I'm Jerry. He was trying to approve, to discern what was the best way to express himself and his love for his child at that moment. Thirdly, this morning, I want you to see that our love should be pure. Look at the latter part of verse 10. That you would approve the things that are excellent and superior and that you may be pure and blameless in the day of, G of Christ. In order that, so that, right there at the beginning of verse 10, right? So that, that purpose clause. Paul is praying for one thing. He's praying for one thing for the Philippians, and that is for the expressions of their love for one another to keep growing so that they will be pure, or your text may say sincere, and express their love in the right ways. The word for pure could also be translated sincere. Now, for us, sincere is a compliment, right? It's a, it's a, it's a virtue. It's kind of the, the highest value. You'll hear people say, hey, you know, whatever you're going to do, just be, you know, whatever you believe, just be sincere about it. Right? Sincerity. The word that is translated is actually two words, sine sera, which literally means pure or sincere, literally means without wax. It's two words, one word for the word son and the other word to judge. It describes a piece of pottery that was judged in the light of the sun and found to be without cracks and to be found without wax filling in the cracks. Stick with me on this. Devious merchants would use wax to conceal the flaws. All right, so you have a piece of pottery. It's cracked. They would use wax because they could melt it, and it would fill in and dry, and then they would paint it, and to the naked eye, you couldn't tell. 
And so you would have some merchants who would sell and, and, and you know, would say on the, on the little sign on their cart, Sine Sera, without wax. It was a, it was a statement that this is, pottery is true. It's, it's without imperfections. But the devious merchants would use wax to conceal the flaws, but when it was held up to the sunlight, the light would shine through and it would reveal the imperfections. It would show where that filler had been put in, kind of like, you know, body filler on a car. And so Paul is emphasizing here, he says, I pray that you would grow in your, in your love and that it would abound more and more and that you would have knowledge and discernment of what that love ought to look like so that you can approve and distinguish between what's worth getting to off about and what's not worth getting to off about so that your love would be pure, without wax. He's emphasizing having a love that's real without hypocrisy. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9, Paul says, let love be without hypocrisy. In essence, he says, don't be a phony. Don't have a phony, fake, impure motive in your love for others. Don't pretend. Judas, one of the Right, one of the, the 12 that followed Jesus. Judas betrayed Jesus how? With a kiss, an expression of friendship and love. It was fake, it was phony. Matthew Henry, the Bible commentator, wrote this. He said, Hypocrisy is to do the devil's work in God's uniform. And so, when you demonstrate a fake love for somebody, particularly in the body of faith, you're a fake. You're not growing in that love. You're actually not doing God's work. You're doing the work of the enemy. Mature Christian love, Paul says right here at the end of verse 10, is not only pure, but it's blameless in the day of Christ. Now, Paul, like many believers, really believed that, that, that he was, you know, he really believed Jesus would return before his life came to a close. I mean, he lived. Paul is the epitome of what it means to live with eternity in our eyes, right? And so Paul, he, I mean, he always pointed, he said, look, that day that we're waiting for, that day ought to influence how you live this day. Because that day could be this day, and you don't know. So you ought to live like that day could happen any day. So he says, mature Christian love is blameless in the day of Christ, meaning that our lives do not cause others to stumble. And not only do we not cause others to stumble, but we're ready to stand before Jesus in judgment for our lives. Uh, two little tests of discernment here for you. Number one, ask this question. Will what I'm thinking or doing, will it cause others to stumble? Will what I'm thinking or what I'm doing or what I want to do would it potentially call, would it cause somebody to stumble? If it would, then the pure and blameless, wise, discerning thing to do is to avoid it. Second test is, would I be ashamed if Jesus were to show up and return right now while I do what I think I want to do? And then fourthly, our love should be purposeful. Should be purposeful. You see, when our love abounds, and it's kept in the banks of knowledge and discernment. It's a pure love, and God is then glorified. Matter of fact, all of life, all of the life of a Christian should be to glorify God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, Paul said, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Whatever you do. Loving others is a part of whatever we do. Loving others is a part of what we do for the glory of God. The glory of God is not a means by which we, we, we don't seek for God to be glorified so that we get something or we get to do something else. All that we do ends in the glory of God. That is the ultimate. That is the pinnacle. That is where we ought to be striving for. That is the ultimate test of our love. Does it bring glory to God? And how would we know? 
Well, the people around us will feel cared for. They'll feel known. They'll feel loved. They'll feel encouraged. They'll be helped. How will I know if I'm loving others and bringing glory to God? There'll have to be a sacrifice in my life. There'll have to be a sacrifice of choice to choose. We said the first week, how do we spell out love? How do we spell this joy out? J-O-Y. Jesus, others, and then you. How, how will I know if I'm loving others? How will I know if I'm loving in such a way that God is glorified? Well, my first priority will be that I thought about Jesus. And my second priority is that I thought about others without thinking about myself. And when I did think about myself, I didn't stop loving them because it might cost me. I loved them more and more as it abounded in the knowledge and the discernment of Jesus. Our love should be growing, it should be knowing, and it should be showing. He says in verse 11 that we'd be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. The fruit of righteousness, uh, that's, that's the fruit, that's the evidence that should show up in our lives. The fruit of righteousness is that stuff that shows up in our lives when God changes us. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, we, we, if you know your Bible, you'll know that those are the verses, right? The fruit of the Spirit. And look here in verse 22. Galatians 5 22 but the fruit of the Spirit is love I mean out the gate number one he didn't hide it down the road somewhere right it's it's the defining characteristic Paul says the fruit of the Spirit the evidence that Jesus is in us the evidence that we are growing and maturing is that we love people Especially the ones that we don't see eye to eye with. You see, the difference between spiritual fruit and human religious activity is that the fruit brings glory to God, and the activity just exhausts the hound out of me. So, Paul prayed that they would abound and grow in their love for one another. Hey, we ought to pray for our, our, our church that. I mean, do you have a time in the week? You know, is there, is there a day in your prayer life where you say, you know what, on this day I'm, I'm praying for our church. If not, this is a good week to get started. How do I pray? I don't know what to pray. I don't know. Hey, just pray. Just pray. God, help us at Cross Point to grow and abound more and more in our love for one another and that you would be glorified. I mean, just start there. might even need to be more specific like this. God, help me to love others. Specifically, God, help me to love so-and-so. Because y'all all know that inside a family, there's always that one cousin. Right? You go, I don't have a cousin like that. Well, you may be the cousin. We all know that in a family, we get sideways with each other every once in a while. I mean, if it was at your house like it was at my house growing up, my brother and I came to fisticuffs with each other a few times. My sisters threw things at each other. My parents got frustrated with us, right? But at the end of the day, we loved one another. My younger brother and my younger sister, I'm the second of four. They were riding the school bus. We, we rode the school bus to and from school. And so there was this kid uh, messing with our little sister. And my brother said to the kid, said, hey, stop. Leave, leave her alone. And the kid would. It was another little girl. And so my brother, this is elementary school. My brother said to him, said, listen, if you don't stop messing with my sister, I'm going to throw your bag out the window. I mean, that was better than what he could have done, right? I think he had discerned that the, the girl wouldn't stop messing with, with our sister. 
that night got a phone call at the house. I don't know how it works nowadays, but in those days, the school bus driver had my parents' phone number. And the bus driver called the house and said, hey, you know, what in the world? Like Matthew threw this girl's backpack out the window today. We're riding down the highway and... <laughs> so my, my parents came to my brother and, and I, we shared a room. They came in there and, and they told me to leave. And I, I why? I want to stay. You know? So I went in the living room and listened. My, my dad looked at my brother and he said, hey, the, the bus driver just called and said that you threw some kid's backpack out the window going down the road today. Is that true? And I think my parents were hoping my brother would say no. My brother said, yes, I did it. And my dad said, why in the world? He said, I told him to leave my sister alone or that's what I was going to do. He said, I had to keep my word. Now, my brother and sister, they, they didn't get along all that well, right? But there's a love in the family that transcends those difficult moments. Now, listen, I, don't, don't nobody take the kids home. The kids, don't y'all be throwing people's backpacks out the bus window this week. So the preacher said, no, he didn't. Hey, why should we be concerned to pray for God's love to grow more and more in us? The second law of thermodynamics states this, that all energy in the universe is in constant entropy. And I had to look that word up. It is in constant decay. All energy in the universe is in constant decay. You know, in a spiritual life, in our Christian life, it's like there's a spiritual decay. It's like there's a spiritual entropy that pulls us back. We grow in the love of Christ and the world draws us back to its values and to its attitudes. The only way to counteract this entropy and decay is to infuse new energy into the environment. That's why it's necessary for us to get together. That's why it's necessary for us to love one another. That's why it's necessary for us to hang out together and find out that we love and that we like one another. That's why it's necessary, right? Because our joy rooted in the gospel is demonstrated as we love one another with the love of Jesus. And Paul said, I pray you'll just keep growing and growing and growing and abound more and more and more. Understand that we'll never arrive until we make it to heaven. So as we close this morning, I want to speak to three people. The first is the person that's here this morning that has never trusted Jesus as your Savior. You say, hey, I like all this love stuff. I like how that sounds. Apart from Jesus, you'll never have it. So if that's you this morning, you've never trusted, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I plead with you. When we stay in the scene just a moment, I'll be right here. And Trevor's going to be right there. We plead with you. Just slip out and come forward and say, hey, I'm the one that needs to trust Christ today. We want to help you to come into a saving knowledge and faith relationship with Jesus Christ. That's person number one. Person number two is the person that, I mean, like, you're just happy in the faith family. Like life is good. You love your church. Hey, I want to encourage you to make the commitment to keep growing in that love. And the third person is the one who would say, hey, I'm, I find more resentment in my heart than I do love for people in my heart. That's not that you have a problem with people so much. Problems here are a reflection of problems here. Don't put the cart before the horse. Come, come back to God. God, help me to love you so that I can grow and love others. I'm going to pray. We're going to stand and sing. And I plead with you to come to Jesus today. God in heaven, Father, we thank you and praise you. God, this life is hard. It gets complicated and challenging. Sometimes we let ourselves and our circumstances get in the way. So God, this morning, would you help us to rearrange our lives 
so that Jesus is first, others, and then ourselves. God, I pray for a response of faith in all of our hearts and our lives to you today in Jesus' name.